Father, we thank you for our development uh, session tonight. Thank you for our leaders. Thank you for our men, our women, our pastors, overseers, and workers in every section. We're asking, Lord, that you bless your people tonight in Jesus' name. Open our eyes to see, our minds to perceive, and let us receive your word and walk by the word in Jesus' name. Let the word profit everyone and profit the ministry in our hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Another good, good amen. God bless you. Consider we're coming to Hebrews chapter 2. And I'm reading to you from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. He's talking to leaders. Here is the apostle saying, we ought to give attention to the word. He counted himself as part of that. He said, you, myself, everyone like me, we apostles, we preachers, we pastors. He says, therefore, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which you have heard. He says, because the possibility is there to let them sleep. It's talking okay about something slipping out of your hand, getting away from you, coming out of your mind that you don't remember anymore. Now he's talking to Hebrew people too. This is the epistle to the Hebrews. You see the Jewish people, there was a tendency for them to hold on to the last and the past tradition and to the old covenant and to Moses and to the law and to the temple. That's the whole of the conflict in the Acts of the Apostles. And he says, you know, you know, I'm a Jew myself. I'm an Hebrew of the Hebrews. And he says, therefore, we who are Jews or Hebrews, we ought to keep the more honest seed to the things which we have heard, lest we should let them sleep. But he says, I identify with the Gentiles, because I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. And as we Gentiles who have received the word, and will receive the new light concerning Christ, Christ our Savior, and Christ our Lord, and Christ the only begotten Son of God, it says we, you Gentiles, identify myself with you, we ought to give the more honesty to the things which we have heard. The possibility is there that we can let those things leap away from us and then we're not going to have any benefit for what we're learning. Now you see the chapter begins with the word. Tell me the word at the beginning of that chapter. It says, therefore. Anytime you see that therefore, you need to think a little and say, what's he talking about? Because it says, therefore. And actually, as you look at the epistle to the Hebrews, he uses that word, therefore, in a very constructive way, in a very instructive way. And look at this. I'm reading to you from chapter 4. I'm reading from chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 1. It says, let us therefore fear. You see, he's been talking about something. He says, all those Jews and the Hebrew people that came out of Egypt and they went through the wilderness, they lost out. They were not able to make it because of unbelief. Immediately mentioned that, he says, therefore let us fear, lest a promise be left us of entering in, in into his rest, any of us should come short of it. You see, it's always concerned about letting that thing sleep, letting it get away from your hand, and therefore you are not able to make any profit. Look at verse 11. It says, let us labor therefore. It says, let us labor therefore. The rest has been provided for all the people, but they missed it. And because they missed it, are you not going to take a lesson from that? And you see the word therefore again, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest anyone fail or fall after the same manner, after the same example of unbelief. It's, all, it, it's a warning. It says, look at this, then therefore do this. Look at that, therefore do this. Look at verse 15, verse 16. It says, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Look at the word, therefore, now verse, verse 16. Let us therefore come. Let us therefore come. It says, you'll face temptation, you'll face trial. And because those trials are there, it says, the, the Lord 
God has overcome. He overcame in every temptation and trial. And he says, therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now let's come to chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. I'm showing you the instructive way in which he used that word, therefore. You see, in chapter 5, at the end of chapter 5, he's been talking about the slow progress of these uh, people that was right into. At the end of chapter 5, he said, you should have been teachers by now, leaders by now, apostles by now. You should have been leaders that will be able to evangelize and do the work of God effectively and profitably. But you still love that somebody should still teach you. Then in chapter 6, it says, therefore, therefore, because we've lost time. We've lost uh, progress and we've lost success. And the time you ought to have been teachers, you are not teachers yet, buck up. Now rise up, now do something now. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Have you noticed something? Every time he says, therefore, then he brings this to us and he says, let us, let us move on. Let us go on to perfection, not going to the foundation again. And now he tells us in chapter 10. As you look at chapter 10, we're still following that use of the word, therefore, from verse 19. In verse 19, it says, Having therefore, brethren, uh, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. He said, What privilege we have? We have the chance, we have the opportunity of entering in into the holiest by the very blood of Jesus. It says, By new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil. It says, That is, that is his flesh. And having a high priest uh, over the house of God, let us draw near. Every time it says, Therefore, learn a lesson here, be instructed here, be inspired here. Take an example, take a cue from this all the time. Then they will say, let us, let us therefore. It tells us in that verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Uh, let us hold fast the profession, the confession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And I wanted to talk to them again about steadfastness. And he's bringing in the word. Therefore, look at verse 35. In verse 35, cast not away, therefore, your confidence. You've already gone through some trials, and you've already gone some, through some persecution, and by the grace of God, you are standing, and the reward of standing firm and standing fast is coming. And therefore, he says, in verse 35, cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great reward, great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. I pray you receive the promise. For yet a little while, a little while, a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall lay by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back. I said I'm not among the people that draw back. We're not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Come to chapter 13, the word therefore. It tells us in chapter 13, verses 12 and 13, it says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gain. See the price he paid for our sanctification, for our holiness, and for preparation, readiness, preparedness to get to heaven. Look at verse 13, let us go forth. Therefore, therefore, it says because of the sacrifice, because of the provision is made for us, it says therefore in verse 13, uh, let, us, uh, let us go forth unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we sit one to come. And so as you come to chapter 2 verse 1, and you begin uh, this uh, chapter in chapter 2 of the Hebrews, he's saying, Therefore, let us 
give the more earnest heed to the things which you have heard. Now when he says, uh, therefore, what's he referring to? It's referring to, look at what we have learned in chapter 1. Look at the preeminence of Christ. Look at the power of Christ. Look at the position of Christ. And look at the perfection of Christ. It says, therefore, we ought to give the more honest heed. We ought to be very diligent. We ought to be very steadfast and give obedience and attention to the things which we have heard. And then it says, lest at any time. Lest at any time. See, there are many times that come in the life of a child of God. And it says, if we don't give them all honest seed, the time may come. It may be a time you are so happy because you've got this. And then you forget the essential sin, your salvation. You let it sleep. It may be a time of adversity. It may be a time of difficulty. Less at any time. It may be a time of opposition. It may be a time you are going through some things and you are wondering, how can this be? Why should this be? I'm a child of God. Why is this happening? He says, don't forget yourself. No, you still have something you ought to keep. Therefore, he says, therefore, we ought to give the more honesty to the things which you have had. Less at any time we shall let them sleep. He's saying that we shall let them. Is that singular or plural? Tell me out aloud. Plural, let's worship. Let them sleep. You see, sometimes at uh, times you concentrate on one particular doctrine. And because you are riding that horse as a doctrine, you know, and it is this doctrine and that doctrine, this doctrine, this doctrine, all the time, all the others you let them sleep. You'll forget about them. Uh, there are some churches, they are hinged on salvation. They come every time, salvation. They come every time, it's salvation. And all the other deep things of the world, about the things to come, about judgment to come, about eternity, about every other thing in our lives, they let all those things sleep. Other people, they are hooked on healing. And it is their ceiling. That's the, the word of God, by the way. It's the doctrine of the word of God. But they are so attached to that, that all the other things on holiness, on heaven, on readiness for heaven, they allow them sleep. And it says, therefore, because of to a third, about the completeness of Christ, about the perfection of Christ, about the totality, the entirety of what Christ means to us, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. You see, the Hebrews that was writing to, they were hooked on Moses, their respect for Moses, their exaltation for Aaron, and their appreciation for Abraham. And because of those patriarchs, because of the prophets of old, they were gluing their eyes and their gaze upon the patriarchs and the prophets and the people of the old time, all these things. As the perfect one, as the one appointed by the Father, they let that sleep away from them. Even after they receive the Holy Ghost, and they have learned about Christ, and when the Holy Ghost has come, he will testify of Christ, testify of me, because he will not speak about himself, he will speak about Christ. All those believers in the Acts of the Apostles, think about that. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, go to the house, you just know nothing like that ever entered my mouth before. They had let it sleep, the things concerning Christ. And then when he came back from the house of Cornelius, we heard, you went to the Gentiles and you ate two of them. How could you do that? They let those things sleep, which they had heard from about Christ. And here they were in Antioch, and Peter had been eating with the Gentiles. And all the other Jews came, this is far into the Acts of the Apostles, were now in Galatians. And this is the time you would have thought they've come to maturity. But they let those things sleep. And when he was sitting with them, the other people came, he removed his hand, and he acted innocent. You know why? Because of the tradition. And because of the ceremonies, because of the attachment to the Jewish ceremonies and rites. And Paul the Apostle is saying, we Jews and we Hebrews, we can be guilty of this, that we do not give the more honest heed to the things we're hearing about Christ, and we let those things live, and then the knowledge of Christ becomes unprofitable unto us. Tonight we're looking at profitable and sustained response 
to the heavenly message. Profitable and sustained response to the heavenly message. We've heard the heavenly message and now we need to give a, profit, a prompt response, a profitable response and sustained response to that heavenly message. We're looking at, uh, we're looking at three points. Number one, our earnest devotion to the new message. Our earnest devotion to the new message. This is new by a new and living way. We're now to enter into the holiest of all. And this new message we've heard about Christ, about the way, about the life, about the truth, about the only way into the complete provision of God, we need to give the more honesty to that, our honest devotion to the new message. Point number two, the eternal damnation of negligent men negligent men the eternal damnation for them number three the exclusive dominion of the neglected mediator the exclusive dominion of the neglected mediator number one is the honest devotion to the new message we're coming back to chapter two and we're looking at verse one it says therefore Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we shall let them sleep. We ought to. We ought to. We must. This is compulsory. Any other sin, any other consideration is not as important. This that we have heard, we ought to give the more earnest heed. In First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1, First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1, it says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. We need to give them more honesty, everything you have heard. Can you recollect what we heard about Christ at the Congress? Can you recollect what we heard about God at the Congress? Can you recollect what we heard about uh, the Holy Spirit at the Congress? Do you remember that God is omnipotent? He can do all things. Do you remember that God is omniscient? He knows all things. Do you remember that God is omnipresent? Do you remember the ownership of God? We need to give the more honesty to the things which we have heard. Do you remember the priesthood of Christ? The perfection of Christ, the prophecies of Christ, the predictions of Christ and do you remember the power that cannot be uh, that cannot be conquered that Jesus Christ had, his kingship his royalty, his superiority over all, he says we need to give the more honesty to those things which were heard do you remember about the nature of the Holy Spirit? About the name of the Holy Spirit? About the work of the Holy Spirit? About the wonders of the Holy Spirit? About the grace of the Holy Spirit? And about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Do you remember all those, uh, the personality of the Holy Spirit? He says we need to remember because if we just, you know, we had them and we're not considering them, not going over them. If we do not remember what we have heard, he says we're not doing well, we ought to. We must. This is compulsory for us. We must give them more honesty. Let's come back to Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore, we ought to. What do we ought to do? What, what is it we ought to do? We ought to give them more honest heed to the things which we have heard. To the things which we have heard. And it says, we need to give heed. It says that's not enough. We need to give more, need, more heed. It says that's not enough. We need to give them more Honest heed to the things which we have heard. By the way, Paul the Apostle, what have we heard? He's talking about what we heard in chapter 1. We're looking at chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The things which you have heard, always remember that when you are praying. Always remember that when you're teaching. Always remember that when you're studying the scriptures. Always remember that at every corner, at every crossroad in your life. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake, in times past, unto the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us 
by his son. He says he's giving us the final message. He says all those of the messages from the prophets of the Old Testament, they were preliminary, they were preparatory to the final message that shall come. He has now spoken to us by his son. He says give the more earnest heed to that. Understand? That was the primary school of Christianity. That was the foundation. That was the belief of, uh, of the Christian life. It was to lead us to the real sin which will come through Christ. It says, remember that and don't bury yourself in the old covenant and come to the new covenant. It says, but in this last days he has spoken unto us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things. It says, remember that. Give the monastery to the, what have we had? He is the heir of all things. Christ is the possessor of all things. He goes to verse 3. He says, who be in the brightness of his glory? He says, Jesus Christ, not Moses. Jesus Christ is the, is the brightness of the glory of God. You want to see God the Father? Look at Jesus. What's the action of Jesus? That's the action of uh, the Father. What's the attitude of Jesus? That's the attitude of the Father. He that has seen me has seen the Father. He says, is the brightness of his glory. Don't forget that. Is the express image of his person. Do you see in verse 3? Is the upholder of all things by the word of his power. He holds the whole universe. He holds the whole creation of God by the word of his power. If he's holding the whole universe, wouldn't you know he will hold your life? He can hold your life. He will hold your family. Is the upholder of all things. He said, don't allow that to sleep. Problem time will come. Conflict time will come. Difficult time will come. And the thing that will make you steadfast and make you strong and stable is that you are holding on to the things you have heard. In days chapter 1, and you are giving the more honest seed. It says, when he, he had by himself purged our sins. is our Savior. is a sanctifier. is the one that has purged us from all sin. Now he sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. is the conqueror. is the overcomer. And he's sitting on the right hand side of the heavenly Father. In fact, he tells us being made so much better than angels. He says, remember that. And you know there are people that run after a message from angels. An angel appeared to them. An angel appeared to somebody. An angel took them to, you know, beyond this earth. And then when they come back, they forget about the revelation of the New Testament. They forget the cross. They forget Calvary. They forget Christ. And they forget everything we're learning about Christ. Angel, angel, angel. He saw an angel. An angel spoke to him. He says, don't let the words leave that this Christ is greater than all the angels combined together. Because look at verse 6. And again, when he bringeth his first begotten into the world, he says, let all the angels angels of God, what do they do? Worship him. They are to worship because they worship him as God. It says all that we have heard, don't let that, that he will leave from you because the tendency is what you had known before, before you even came to Christ, you, go, you hold on to that. There's a point you believed of the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Final. And then after that, you, know, you go back to the old idea, old ideology, old opinion, old tradition, old covenant. He says, don't do that. Remain in the new. Because this is what we have heard. And then he tells us in verse 7, and of the angels, he says who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire, but unto the Son. That he says, he says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. God, the Son, is everlasting. Is eternal because he says thy throne, O God, and he's talking to the Son, and he calls him God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of, the, of righteousness, a scepter of righteousness, is the scepter of thy kingdom. He says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Christ is a sinless king. 
I said is a sinless king. It says, therefore, God, even thy God, has anointed thee, and I with the oil of gladness above all thy fellows. Thou, thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. They shall perish, but that remaineth. Jesus Christ has said yesterday, today, and forever. He remains the same. He remains forever. And he says, therefore, therefore, with all this knowledge about Jesus Christ, don't forget, don't forget, don't let that sleep away from you. Therefore, we ought to give the more honesty to the things which we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them sleep. They will not sleep away from us in Jesus' name. The honest devotion of the new message. This was a new message to them. And to many people, it is still a new message. The old is gone and the new has come. We are going to hold on to the new. A new revelation. A new redeemer. And he is the one that will set you free from all afflictions in Jesus' name. I would uh, want you to give a good, good amen. Point number two now, the eternal damnation of negligent men. Eternal damnation of negligent men. We're reading from verses two and three. It says, For if the word spoken by angels was, was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, we each are the first began to be spoken of of the Lord, and by the Lord, and, uh, and was confirmed unto us by them uh, that heard him. God also bearing them uh, witness both with signs and wonders, and with, the, with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will. He says uh, something here. Remember, he's uh, comparing or contrasting uh, Christ or the angels. Christ is higher. Christ is greater. And Christ is creator. But the angels are creatures. And now he says, think about this one now. In the old covenant, the word spoken by angels was steadfast. If they said anything, as the fathers, God sent them to come and declare the word, it was steadfast. And every transgression and disobedience uh, received a just recompense of reward. Anybody who neglected the word of the angel in the Old Testament, he suffered for that. He was punished for that. And now he says, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, this one is not published by an angel, not proclaimed by an angel, not prophesied by an angel, proclaimed and provided for by the Lord himself, which of the falls began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. He said, now salvation, the salvation that Jesus Christ himself provided for, the salvation that he himself proclaimed, and the salvation that he himself has given to those that believe. Not only that, that the Holy Ghost himself now is even giving confirmation to, because it says in verse 4, God also bear in the witness and there were signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will. There's a salvation proclaimed by Christ who is greater than the angels, confirmed by the Holy Ghost greater than the angels. And it says, if the word spoken by the angels stood fast and those who disobeyed, they suffered for it how much more. If anyone will neglect the salvation that Christ has brought. Now we need to understand this because you see, many people delimit this uh, verse 3. How shall we escape? And you've heard a preacher, maybe you preach about this yourself. He's talking to the sinners. How will the sinners escape? Yes, he's talking to sinners. You see, not talking to those who are born again. You can have something and neglect it. Don't you know that? You can have brain and neglect that brain and don't use the brain. You can have hands and possess the hand. It's yours. You may not use the hand. You may neglect it. You may have the Bible. You may neglect that Bible. Not read, not meditate, not obey. You may have salvation and neglect that salvation. Now you've got salvation is stuck on in the corner of your heart and then you go about other things. You never look at that salvation. 
salvation. You don't make use of that salvation. You don't live by that salvation. You can have salvation and neglect it. You can have a birthright and neglect that birthright. Look at this. He's saying, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. I want to talk about uh, those who are negligent because this point is talking about the eternal damnation of negligent men, of negligent men. Uh, the negligent uh, will not escape eternal, cons the eternal consequence of their neglect. The religious person who is not born again may neglect salvation because they don't want to believe in Christ. They see their self-righteousness is enough for them. But even then, some possessors of good things, of salvation, may neglect that good thing that they have got. And therefore, eventually, because you neglect what you have got, you lose it. Number one, there are negligent sinners. Negligent sinners. I'm coming to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. It says, For if the word spoken by angels was, uh, was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by them that heard him? Uh, those are sinners that reject, that neglect the salvation of the Lord, first, first Peter chapter 4, and I'm reading from verses 17 and 18. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17, verse 18. But the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, us believers, us Christians, what shall the end of them be that will pay not the gospel? The sinners don't save. And if the righteous can't be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Sinners who neglect salvation. Who are those sinners? Don't they go to church? Of course, many sinners go to church, but they neglect salvation. Many sinners even try to work for the Lord in their denomination, their congregation, and yet they neglect salvation. How will they escape the judgment of God? Point number two, the negligent saint. The negligent saint. Uh -uh. But the saint, how can he neglect? You better believe there are saints that neglect their salvation. They are saved already, but they don't keep that salvation. They neglect that sin. They joke with that sin. They gamble with that sin, and they play with that salvation. We're looking at Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter 17, I'm reading here from verse 28. Likewise also, as it was in the days of flood, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built it. But the same day that Lord entered in, uh, out, uh, that Lord uh, went out of Sodom, he trimmed fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, then he goes on, and he tells us in verse 32, everybody read that one, two, three, go. Who oh, was he talking to sinners? Who oh, was he talking to? His own disciples. He says, remember, remember, Lord's wife. There can be negligent sins, they are saved. And he knew the Lord, but they're not taking care of that salvation because I'm saved, I'm saved. We're looking at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto the ten virgins which took their lambs and uh, went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lambs, and they took uh, no oil with them. And it says, But the wise took oil in their lambs, in their vessels, with their lambs. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. 
and the Polish virgins were not complete yet. They didn't have the extra oil that they needed. They were virgins. They were waiting for the Lord. They knew about the coming of the Lord. And they were all waiting. And they were not worldly. But they neglected to get ready. And eventually when they came, when Christ came, the bridegroom, when he came, it says that the wise virgins, they entered in. And the foolish said, give, give us of your oil. For our lambs are gone out. They said, no, go and buy for yourself. Look at the conclusion. It says in verse 13, Watch therefore, for ye know, not, ye know neither the day nor the hour when, when, when here wherein the Son of Man cometh. He's talking to believers. He's talking to saints. And there are saints who are negligent. Number one, negligent sinners. Number two, negligent saints. Number three, negligent soul winners. Negligent soul winners. You see, how will the sinners escape judgment? How will they escape eternal perdition if the soul winners fold their hands, if they close their mouth, if they shut their eyes, and if they tie their feet and they are not moving out and they are not doing what they ought to do? If they are negligent, how shall we escape if you neglect so great salvation? Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, I'm reading from the star China. Whoso, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, God shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? If the preachers don't go out to tell them, how will they be saved? If the preachers are negligent, how will they be saved? If the soul winners are negligent, how will they be saved? In verse 13, and how shall they preach except they be saved? If as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. He's saying that a will who have the word of God must not be negligent. Son of man, have made you a watchman over the house of Israel. Hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. If you are negligent and you don't want them, they will perish in their sin, but their blood will I require at your hand. Number one, negligent who? Tell me. Negligent sinners. Number two, tell me. Negligent sins. Number three, tell me. Negligent soul winners. Now you must ask yourself, are you negligent? Are there people around you you should have told? Is your child saved? Are your children saved? Are your parents saved? Are your co workers saved? You rub shoulders with them every time. You talk about every subject under heaven, but you never talk about salvation. Are you not negligent? How will they be saved if you are negligent? Number four, negligent shepherds. Negligent shepherds. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 13, uh, and I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 13, uh, we're reading from verse 24. In Matthew chapter 13, verse uh, 24, uh, we're looking at this, and it says, Another parable put forth, uh, put it forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of uh, heaven is likened unto a man who sowed good seed in his field, and while men slept, you see, when you sleep like that, you are negligent. There are people, you are passed over by a local congregation. Aren't you negligent? You always delegate somebody else to preach. But you are there. I'm training them. How are you training them? You're not showing them example. You're not showing them example that you know the word that you are prepared to teach. You are not showing them the example that you really are a, a kind of a vigilant over their lives and you delegate every time. And while you delegate and they are preaching, you are not there. You are not there. If you, if you were there and you were listening and then after the message you are going to correct them, you call them aside, you correct them, then we know you are training them. But you delegate it every time, your responsibility and the preaching of the word. Backsliders are there, they report them to you. You, you're not going to do anything. You say, okay, uh, I've heard, I've heard. Since you've told me, it's now out of your hand, but it's not in your hand. You're not doing anything, and they cannot do anything about that. While men slept, negligent shepherds, negligent pastors, while men slept, his enemy came and so tears among the wheat and went his way. And then you know the whole story, but it says in the, at the latter time, in Bustachi, but let them grow to 
together unto the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together, force the chairs, and bind them in bundles, and bind them, but gather the wheat into the barn. What's the condition of members of your church? What's the condition of your local church? What's the condition of the workers in your church? Have you so delegated everything and you are never there to supervise and to know what is going on at all? Negligent shepherds. We're looking at uh, Second Peter. In Second Peter, I'm reading from chapter one. Second Peter, chapter one, and I'm reading from verse twelve. Second Peter, chapter one, verse twelve. Wherefore, I will not be negligent. This is Peter talking. I will not be negligent. This is shepherd. I will not be negligent. This is the pastor. I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established Established in the present truth. Number one, tell me negligence. And number two, tell me negligence. Number three, number four, tell me. Number five, negligent servants. Negligent servants. We're looking at the first, uh, first kings, and I'm reading from chapter 20. First kings, chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 20, 39, 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 39. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant, uh huh, this is servant, thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. And behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man, if by any means be missing, then shall thy life go for his life or else he shall pay a talent of silver. And in verse 40, and as the servant was, tell me, can I hear you? Busy here and there, he was gone. That's the servant. He said, as the servant was at the battlefield, a man was brought to me. How many cards of people that came to the church for the first time have we received? How many cards of the people that gave their lives to the Lord in a crusade, at the retreat, in an open air meeting have we received and were busy about all things? If we get all those cards, we we'll store them somewhere and then we're busy. I have a committee meeting here. I have another meeting here. And somebody is getting married there, I have to be there. Somebody is uh, celebrating something there, I have to be there. Good, good things that take the best away from your hand. As the servant was busy, here and there, he was gone. That's a negligent servant. I was told in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 47. Luke chapter 12, reading from verse 47. It tells us in verse 47, it says, And that servant, that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself. Prepared not himself. It's too busy about many other things. Uh, you know, if, if we look at it very well, if you're so busy to do some things that are very, com very important and compulsory in the house of God, and you do not have the time to really shepherd the people of God and to lead the people of God and to teach the people of God, instead of exposing you to danger, condemnation, damnation, and doom, you get out of that area that you don't really have attention for, you don't have time for, so you can be busy here and there doing what you are doing so you don't become guilty as a negligent servant because that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself neither did according to his will shall be beaten tell me tell me if you knew that will be beaten with many stripes, but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes, for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more. 
And then we have negligent scorners. Negligent scorners. Those are the people, you want them of the danger to come, but, but they're negligent. They say, well, that's all right, that's all right. Uh, whatever will happen, let it happen. I've heard, so hold it on to yourself. They are the negligent scorners, and they're always at ease. They don't take anything uh, serious. Uh, there, there's a problem, there's a cloud of, uh, of judgment coming. They say, yes, I understand. And then you say, the word of God says, the word of God declares, if this happens, that, well, it's a yes. Of course, I know that. Am I a novice in reading the Bible, knowing the Bible? I know that. And they are careless. Look at Amos chapter 6. Amos chapter 6, verse 1. Warn to them that at ease is Zion. Warn to them that at ease is Zion. Judgment is coming. They are at ease. They are not measuring up. They are at ease. You want them, they're at ease. You wake them up, they're at ease. They're never serious about anything. And then it tells us in that Amos chapter 6, look at verse 3. It says, She that put far away the evil day and caused the seed of violence to come near that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the, and the calves out of the midst of the store. It says they just take life easy. Luxury. That's the name of the game of their life. And all they want is ease and convenience. They sleep, they eat and what else? Nothing more. Look at verse 13. It says, ye which rejoice in a thing of naught. The things that are temporary. These are people that are scorners. They scorn about eternal things. They are at ease. They don't care about things that are really essential. Ye which rejoice in a sin of naught, which say, Have we not taken to us horns by our own strength? But behold, our race up against you, a nation, O house of Israel. I pray we'll rise up and do what we need to do. You will not be negligent. I will not be. Say it for yourself. The negligent sinners. Are they living in your house? Children, mother, father, relatives, maid, servant, co worker, and colleagues. Are they living with you? They are negligent. Are you a negligent? Negligent saints. They know that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. They're not serious about that. Negligent shepherds, they have a church uh, to look over, to watch over. They're not doing it. It's like they don't have any responsibility. And then when you ask them, you find them outside their church location on a worship day. And then when you find them, they're just loitering. They're doing things that, you know, and you're not going to account for in heaven. I say, come on here. Who are you? I am a Christian. Anything more? Actually, I'm a pastor. But this is worship time. And the worship is going on there now. Why are you here? You know, I just need to take a break. I need to, you know, roam about a little and become a negligent shepherd. I pray God will deliver you in Jesus' name. Like your soul winners, we're all going out and we're winning souls. He says he's born again. He has the tracks in his hand. He has, uh, you know, the track to read. He has all the materials and he's holding them down there. All the people are going out and it's just there. It's negligent or negligent servants or negligent corners. But look at this negligent sleepers. Negligent sleepers. We're coming to Jonah chapter 1, Jonah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me, and Jonah rose up eh, and prayed to flee to Tashish eh, from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a sheep going to Tashish, and so he paid, so he paid the fear thereof, and went down into it to go to, to go with them uh, unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind uh, into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the, into the, in the sea, so that 
the uh, ship was like to be broken. Now then the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay, and he was tell me, fast asleep. So the, the ship master came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will seek upon us that will perish not. That was a negligent prophet, a negligent sleeper. And you see all the signs around us. The earthquakes, the volcanoes, nation against nation, and the signs of the coming of the Lord so near. And we know that we're nearer today, the time of the coming of the Lord, than we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And yet there are people that are not prepared. They're sleeping. They're sleeping. And it says in Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, reading here from verse 11, it says, And that knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is fast spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let's wake up. We have slept too long, for too long. Let's wake up because the coming of the Lord is very near. First Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, reading here from verse 3. But when they shall see peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day shall overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. And we are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, tell me. Therefore, tell me out aloud. Don't be a Jonah. Therefore, say it again. Let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch and be sober. Let us watch and be sober. The danger is there that one could be. A negligent sinner, a negligent saint, a negligent soul winner, a negligent shepherd, a negligent servant, a negligent scorner, a negligent sleeper. And how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? I pray all the people around us they will escape the judgment of God in Jesus' name. And you will escape. I will escape. I will escape. Say for self, I will escape. There will be no area of your life you'll neglect in Jesus' name. Uh, you know something that uh, almost uh, happened uh, to Timothy and took him over? A good man, a good disciple, a good follower. He was negligent about his gifts. The gifts upon him, the gifts to preach. The gift to pray, the gift for miracles, the gifts of the Spirit upon his life, in his life. He was negligent about that. And Paul, the apostle, said, Timothy, you are neglecting something. And you will not finish your ministry and complete it very well if you remain negligent. Stop the gift that is within you. Everyone here has a gift from God. The gift that will make you successful and progressing in the coming in the work of the Lord, you will not be negligent in Jesus' name. We're coming to we're coming to Hebrews chapter two, Hebrews chapter two, and I'm reading now from verse five. Hebrews chapter two, verse five. Uh, it says, "For unto the angels as see not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we we'll speak." It's not going beyond this world. It's saying there's a world to come, eternity. There's a world to come, heaven. There's a world to come the kingdom beyond this world 
and that is not under the subject, not subjection unto the angels. It says in verse 6, but one in a certain place testified, saying, and what is man that thou art mindful of him? Of the Son of Man that thou, thou visitest him. And there's something we call in the Bible a scripture of double reference. Double reference. Number one, it refers to man, that is, you and I, referring to us. But it also refers to the man, that is, to the Messiah, that is, to the Master, that is, to the Mediator, that is, to the one who died for us. And this, also, although it refers a little to man, the first Adam, but this is referring uh, more and more unto the second Adam. Look at verse 7, it says, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Yes, it refers to Adam, it refers to us, but it refers to Christ. Christ, uh, jump down to jump up to verse 9. Verse 9, are you in verse 9 now? But we see Jesus, tell me, was made a little lower than the angels. You see, it refers to Christ more than it's referring to us. It's the law of double reference. It says in verse 7, uh, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Thou cryest to him with glory and honor. That refers to us a little, but that refers to Jesus Christ more than mortal man. Come to verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Crowned with glory and honor. Ultimately, this referring to Christ. And then you go, son, look at verse 8. And thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. It's referring to Christ now, ultimately. For in that he put in subjection under his feet, under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, under man. But now in verse 9, but we see Jesus, who is the fulfillment of this in all its entirety. But we see Jesus, who has come with glory and honor. But we see Jesus, who has the final and the ultimate and the eternal glory and dominion. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He has to put on humanity so that he can die for us. He has to allow himself incarnation to be born of a woman, of a virgin, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God shall taste death for every man. Point number three, the exclusive dominion of the neglected mediator. Exclusive dominion, this belongs to him. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 21. Ephesians chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 21, ultimately talking about Jesus Christ far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. And has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church is the head of all. And he has dominion. He has a name that no other man has. So we're looking at John chapter 3, verse 35. John chapter 3, we're reading from verse 35. In John chapter 3, verse 35, For the Father loveth the Son, and has given all things into his hand. Ultimate authority and final dominion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, reading from verse 27. First Corinthians chapter 15, we're reading from verse 27. In verse 27, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things put under him, it is manifest that he is exempted which did put all things under him. He's saying the Father is not under him. But all other things are under him, under Christ. Because of what he has done. Because of the sacrifice that uh, he, he made. And because of subjecting himself to the death on the cross. In uh, Philippians chapter 2. Reading from verse 9. 
Philippians chapter 2 verse 9, wherefore God also has highly exalted him. Our Christ is exalted. Our Savior is exalted. And has given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus. How many knees? Every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, to the glory of God the Father. First Peter chapter 3 verse 22. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 22. In First Peter chapter 3 verse 22 it says... Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Christ is all in all. He's the preeminent one. He's the supreme one. And he has all authority. And I pray that everyone will sub every one of us will submit unto him in Jesus' name. Now it tells us, let's come back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter one, chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more honest age to the things which we have heard. What we have heard about Christ, about his coming again, and about his salvation, about his provision for us, and about the great work he has given into our hands. Let us give the more honesty to the things we have had. Lest at any time, at any time, we should not dare, we should let them sleep. They will not sleep away from us in Jesus' name. Now we are coming to chapter 4, chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted like as we are, and yet without sin. Let us therefore come back boldly unto him unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need remember the promises of God and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved shall be sanctified, shall be strengthened, shall be healed shall be delivered and shall partake in the dominion of Christ in Jesus name all things are yours Remember what you have. Take hold of them. You'll succeed in the ministry in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. That all these things we have heard, everything we'll be hearing, will not hear in vain. We'll take them to the Lord in prayer and we'll profit from the word we're hearing. Open your mouth. Talk to the Lord.